we're in, uh, erupting in enthusiasm to have you back for this, our 272nd show of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And us is our bald triumvirate here <laughs> with uh, the first bald guy, the Soto Brown in his Bishop Museum. The Hello, second everyone. one, Martin Despang here in his Waikiki <laughs> brand. And the third one, most important, our guest, or we can say by now co-host, being in the ninth <laughs> show. This is Matt Noblet, our Boston Banish booster in his Boston, back in his Boston. Hi, Matt. Hi. So we wanted to get uh back to which we will to the building you show us and share us uh telling us that or showing us that bioclimatic system medic uh, thinking is universal and then depends on the region and the climate how you apply it but speaking of that and talking about eruptive enthusiasm let's get us to the first slide and you to sort of from here because you grew up with that phenomenon tell us what <laughs> exciting natural system we're having here that um, actually the one on the left don't worry we may don't make you to read it all this comes this is interesting in a global world this comes first and foremost from our exotic escapism expert Susanne who knew before us from her Bayerischer Rundfunk uh, app here that uh, about that happening here on the island which is the Soto well, it is the eruption of Mauna Loa for the first time since 1984. And while we're all very accustomed to the eruptions of Kilauea volcano, also on Hawaii Island, the difference with Mauna Loa, which is very important, is that it is a much bigger volcanic system. And so it erupts a great deal more lava than Kilauea does. And while at the moment, this new lava eruption, lava flow, is not threatening anything directly and hasn't it, it hasn't destroyed any structures yet. It is in danger of covering or cutting off the Saddle Road. And the Saddle Road is very important across the island of Hawaii because it carries a lot of traffic. And if it is cut, that's going to be a big pain for everybody to have to go around the long way rather than be able to go the more short, direct route. Now, historically speaking, what's also fascinating is Mauna Loa used to erupt a lot more frequently than it has in the 20th century. And in 1880 and 1881, it went through a very lengthy eruption that was threatening Hilo, the city of Hilo, because the lava was approaching very close. And people in Hilo appealed for assistance to Princess Ruth Ke'ili Kolani, and she was a very high ranking noble woman or Ali of that time period. And she traveled to the oncoming front of the lava flow and she chanted to Pele, who is the goddess of the volcanoes, and she threw offerings onto the hot lava and it actually did stop. And Hilo was saved. And so this time the lava is still a long way from Hilo, but it is going in that general direction. And we don't have Princess Ruth today to help us. So lava, unlike other things like water, cannot be stopped or redirected for very long by human beings. And people have tried it in Hawaii and people have tried it in Iceland. And so we, if we are lucky, the flow will stop before it causes a great deal of damage. But if it gets into where people live, nothing you can do except get out of the way and say goodbye to any structures, any infrastructure, any vegetation, et cetera. And, and that, that's, that being said, so that, that's a human problem, I guess, we have with that because we're in the way of Pele, not the other way around, right? So it's a system that works. Uh, to the right of that, in the, in the top right, is a, is a human-made system. That's the, the artificial man-made machine. I just made it, luckily, back on time. Uh, that's our additional family mobile that is, a, is of German uh, manufacturing. And we will talk about that when we get back to our automobile uh, and uh, immobile show. And, and that one tends to uh, overheat. And we go through this tremendous effort, right? There's actually little uh, eruptions, explosions in there in the engine. And then we recirculate water to keep it cool, to keep it under control. 
and and that is vulnerable to breaking as we experience here in these days so there's one system that is you know perfected and the other one is rather imperfect and what's also perfect seems to imperfect seems to be the human nature because at the bottom right your second uh weekly german exercise to soto which we don't put you on the spot don't worry but it says uh, the winter in the Ukraine uh, is is facing uh, windowless um, uh, flats and units, apartments, and we've been reporting about that. So, Matt and I, we were thinking before the show, if you could only do an, um, a heat transfer, literally speaking, right, <laughs> that we give a little bit of that excess heat to the poor ones in the Ukraine who are now faced with the second really bad winter and people can't sustain their temperature uh, behind these shattered, uh, you know, uh, glazings. And getting us to the ne next slide, please, on, on again, a very sort of comfortable level and, uh, you know, almost feeling bad to even talk about these sort of luxury issues. Um, but let's say we talked about, you know, architects like Foster are offering already to be helping to rebuild you know, the Ukraine, when that happens, um, it might be in, in this matter here or in this manner. These are predominantly picture I took in uh, the beginning of this year, still back in Germany, where it was cold. And you see the center picture there with the two gentlemen who happen to be Joey and Lenny, and they have puffy coats on. And they're going towards what is called the Stadttor, which is the city gate, kind of the gateway buildings we're having, the you know, in, in Waikiki, uh, the Soto. And uh, the one left to that is the is the post tower for the German uh, postal service. And above there, the show quotes is, is you guys met with the parliament in Bonn, which is where the post tower is, and then the Nord LB in my hometown and the Unilever building. And we show the timelines. And so not until I was there and the whole Putin thing blew up on us in Germany, I, I became aware how innovative these uh, double facades were, um, you know, at that time uh, for us. And if we would all have these, you know, back in the tempered, we would be uh, pretty, um, we could be pretty relaxed, pretty chilled. Um, I, to the right is right next to the, to the Stadthaus was, was this very cute, you know, Lanai uh, in, in uh, where people sort of <laughs> helped themselves and put up this shower curtain on a, on a track and, and their and their vegetation on their lanai and trying to do kind of a bottom up strategy, which is what the emerging generation here at the very bottom down there at Saunders basically did at the beginning of the semester. Um, and so, uh, yeah, these are just I just want to put into context, Matt, uh, please add to that how I think, again, you, you started this trend in Bonn with a parliament building, our most important building that, you know, the ones who run us uh, work in. And then to be continued, and that was still by by Günther, right? And then when Stefan right. took over, he basically pushed it to the challenge of the 21st century, and saying, "Well, um, you know, there's a there's a social responsibility, but there's also the solar responsibility." Increasingly, these are just my thoughts. I wanted to share from the beginning of the year to then maybe go to the next slide because this is then again the Gensheim once again returning to it. And as we've been talking about the inner facade towards the courtyard and the heliostats and all that stuff uh, pretty elaboratively, let's talk a little bit about the exterior skin here, Matt. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think as you mentioned, you know, started going, going back into the sort of the roots of our firm where Gunter Benisch had a, a very strong focus on sort of demo, the democratic, let's say, aspect of architecture and the social kind of aspect of architecture. Um, when our firm was founded in the in the early 90s, it really sort of shifted that focus, or I would say maybe was sort of added to that the idea of a of of how to build more sustainably, how to sort of take some of these ideas that had been have, have been gestating for a long time in Germany uh, for very you know logical reasons. It's not necessarily that that in Germany people are just more altruistic than they are everywhere else, but to be honest, energy prices are very high and land is scarce. And so people are very motivated to find uh, reasonable solutions to driving the energy demand of a building down. And I think it, the facade is an absolutely critical part of that, how you solve 
and stop the forces that drive energy consumption at the perimeter of the building before they even get to the inside is, is a critical aspect of that. So um, all the buildings you mentioned are, are these so-called double facade buildings. And um, in some cases they've been done sort of with more technical, uh, more sort of technical precision or an, an idea that um, the so-called self-ventilating facade, you know, there's two, there's two ways to approach double facade design. There's the sealed version and the sort of self-ventilating version. Ours have tended to be a little bit more pragmatic in that we know that it's important to have um, exterior sunshade on a building, essentially to have some system that blocks the sun from hitting the exterior glass before it enters the building, which is what creates the greenhouse effect, right? You trap ultraviolet rays inside the building, which re-radiate re uh, and, and create heat. Um, but the problem with those, if they're flexible, if you want to do them flexibly, you need to protect them against high winds and things like that. So that kind of gives rise to this um, what I what I termed earlier the kind of poor man's um, double facade that we have at the Genzyme building, which is really basically a second wall built inboard of the exterior wall. The exterior wall is a single glazed uh, facade, and then inboard of that is the weathering wall. In between them, you can have the sun shading and daylight redirection devices and things like that. Um, but that does create this kind of buffer zone around the outside of the building. Um, it's unfortunately also tempting for smokers to use as a porch for their activities, but for users, it's actually a very nice space to step out into uh, and be in a kind of an in-between zone. And you can see in that, that photograph on the right, uh, one of my colleague's sons actually operating a, a manual flap in the, in the wall, at the base of the wall that allows you to get more fresh air in your office if you open it. So that's, yeah, that's essentially and, what we're looking at. And it reminds me of the precursor, the Nord LB that I'm very familiar because it's my it's in my hometown. And I, I said, it's, I don't know of any other building that is so controversial um, by avoiding to say people love or hate it. If they hate it, which they don't really do, but it's mostly, which I found out because where I had my first uh, you know, adjunct coaching gig in Bremen, a professor colleague of mine, um, uh, was friends with the big bank boss of the Nord LB. So he was able to not only give us a tour, but also show us a secret chamber that otherwise you don't see, which is two people operating just like in Star Trek in their command chamber, all the systems. And so we basically saw our chance and we said, okay, what doesn't work in the building? And their answer was, you referred that to that a couple of times before. And this image here shows that they said the human factor because when people come in the in the summer and complain it's too warm when they come into the office, they say, well, there is this manual flap that you open before you leave the office and it activates the night cooling, which you have been talking about a lot. And then when you come in in the morning, you know, it's cool. But if you don't do that, it's your own fault. So, and I think it was an interesting discussion that, that you said, uh, Matt, that people consider your buildings to be high tech but you don't consider that, you consider them to be just exposed tech, right? And participatory technology, right? Yeah, I mean, I think people tend to think of tech as, you know, sort of servo motor motors and lots of cables and wiring and intelligent, you know, control systems and so forth. I mean, I really think, you know, this flap that, um, that Philip there is, is, is opening, it couldn't be simpler. That's technology in the sense that we think about it, right? It's, it's basically, um, you know, things that we can do in a building to enable the user to be more in harmony with, with the way the building should function, right? And to make it somehow also evident to them how it should function, what they should do to make their, themselves more comfortable rather than pick up the phone and call that secret chamber and complain to those people. Uh, the goal really is to try to make the building as engaging for people uh, and, and enable the work and the comfort that they seek, right? That, they, that they're trying to do. Matt, let me ask you a question here. Does this sort of buffer zone function as a corridor, or is it just something that's there and it isn't usually used by people to uh, travel around inside in the building? It's not, a, it's not, I mean, you could go from space to space on it. It wraps around, you know, it goes around, not, it doesn't go fully around the exterior of the building, but, um, but it is, you, you could in theory do that since it's, it's essentially outdoor space, right? It's, it's protected from the wind by the outer, the outer glass. Um, but it, it, like in Boston where this is, it wouldn't be comfortable to use as a regular circulation uh, sort of element. So um, it's, it's, it has more, it more is a performance element. 
uh, which has the benefit of being sort of like a little breezed in porch for people use them often, right? They, in fact, the, the, I don't know today, the, the company, the, the building has unfortunately changed hands recently, but um, in uh, the entire time that the Genzyme Cor Corporation owned that and the Biomed Realty uh, owned it, they included that square footage in their uh, calculations for the, for the leasing rates, right? It wasn't, considered uh, extraneous or, or, or kind of, you know, non-leasable space because people saw the benefit in being able to uh, open their door onto the, just basically it's a, it's a kind of lanai, right? Um, in the way that we've been talking about it <clears throat> and the, the quality of the air and the way that, you, that the kind of environment that it engenders is very sort of unique and, and people were more than willing to pay the money for that because they were uh, getting very positive, you know, feedback from their, from their users. We so during a show, oh, oh sorry, so, I was just going to say. So during some parts of the year, this would be a comfortable space to be in. Uh, not mm -hmm. during the full, not during the full on winter, but during the spring, summer, and fall, there might be very comfortable days where you could be out there. So it would be sort of a living space in addition to having the function that you've described as being the buffer between the outside and the inside. Right, right. Okay. It's a bit of a tech, it's a bit technical in there when you go in. I mean, you know, there's the flaps for the ventilation and so forth, but it's, it's also this idea. I mean, what's a night, what's always nice in, when you work in the same kind of space or live in the same space all the time, this idea that you can actually win a little bit of space just by, you know, opening a, a, a flap or moving a door or something. It's a very nice feeling, right? We have a roof deck at my house that's totally unusable during the winter, right? Start, we just, we just packed it up. But when we reopen it in April or May, it's getting later every every year. But like when we do reopen it, it's like it's like adding a room to the house. And this is such a great feeling. And, and this is a small version of that, right? It's like in these these months, you somehow break up the year by knowing that like you've got this additional sort of buffer of space out there. This is also a way that people feel a little bit like they can kind of manipulate their environment and and uh, and benefit right from the way the building is configured very familiar to us here in many ways to soda right and uh show quote at the bottom right this is what we said you know if it would have happened that your wife's you know uh father it was right would have been able to move into an elderly <laughs> home we wish he could have gone to the uh senior social senior housing on the beginning of kalakawa avenue by Frank Slavsky, who was, this is the fenestration to the north to Malka where the winds blow. So he decided to, in fact, have a fixed glazing single pane to just keep the, 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 the wind away, but the air he wants. So the air comes mm -hmm. in from below through this, you know, open flap, you can say. So very much, again, um, you know, similar thinking of very simple manual system, operable, in uh, sort of um, opposite kind of climate conditions, but the same thinking, right? Yeah, and that's wanna... exactly the that's exactly the detail that uh, that the Lillestrand house has as well yep. at the top of the window, but yep. also yep. Malka side, cool winds coming down the mountain. Yeah, and he Osipov introduced a little flap that you just reach up and open, yeah, yeah. and then it flows all the way through the building. That's an even better example, thank you, which you DeSoto are nodding in the right direction because you grew up in that <laughs> in with that systems in an Osipov house, so even better because that one is even you know, has a hinge and can open and close. This one here can. And so this discussion to be continued and we started already show quote at the top left. This was with Wolf Meyer when he was visiting us long time ago on the previous show, Urban Transcendence. And he, before that was working for Christoph Ingenhofen, who was another buddy um, who was working in the same direction. And I, I want to point this out that not just within the culture of you guys firm ever since Günther, when people split off, it wasn't like uh, considered to be like, what is it called, moonlighting or something like that. Or there is a guy who, you know, to blame. And But it's actually, okay, <laughs> the more the merrier. I mean, there's Awa and Weber. There's, there's all these people who, who are a spinoff, Danish, and basically spread the word. And so it is with, with this that, you know, Helmut Jan and Pitzinka, and Pitzinka started out with Ingenhofen on the Stadttor, and then Ingenhofen went on his own, and Ulf worked for him. And, and we started this discussion about, you know, double facades, uh, whatever you want to call it. And, if, and I think we should continue that. 
it's not that easy as in many things, but it's certainly something to keep uh, in the back of the mind. And next slide, certainly to engage the emerging generation in that, because they might need or want to work under these conditions of the other 60% of the world climates. And this is what we have been doing here in the second assignment. And Michelle, your colleague was uh, with us, thankfully here. And you both and Michelle again will be with us coming Monday when we rip up and see what they all took home from this, coming back to their tropical climate. And again, think, doing things significantly different because again, the double facades as we built them over there, which might really, really help us now, especially this winter, uh, might just be too much for here. And you could do, you know, more with less as me mm -hmm. and others kind of like to mm -hmm. say, right? So that being exactly. said. Yeah, um, and, and Martin, you and I have had these discussions about new buildings here, which have added sort of an extra facade, but purely apparently just for ornamentation. And oh, yeah. here in a tropical climate, that doesn't do any good. It just no. creates a little greenhouse that adds a lot more heat to the interior, which we don't need. Yeah, it shoots back. And we're referring to the Gold Bond building on Alamoana Boulevard when we drove out to the airport, uh, Matt, you know, that mm -hmm. sort mm -hmm. of uh, moderate sort of <clears throat> tropical brutalism building with these concrete fins that some interior designer we found out was trying to upgrade it and was encasing a corner in glass. So he was turning what at least gesturally was sort of self-shading into thermal massing, which is the least we need here at all. And of course, there was no and, shading and in between. So and embodied carbon. I mean, yeah, exactly. Every every piece of building you add that you don't need is just more carbon that you've committed to existence. Exactly. And an absolutely, um, you know, <clears throat> exterior outside in approach about a surfacial about the look versus which we try to encourage and and hold accountable to the inside out gestalt approach that gets us to the next and likely last slide for this week because we only have five minutes left. But here we see what uh, is the result when you have that inside out approach, gestalt approach in the uh, Gensheim building, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, here, this is these are some well-selected slides because you see so many elements or I see so many elements that are so crucial to uh, how we conceive of, of successfully integrating uh, what you know, as as you called it before, the high tech um, stuff with you know with the human experience. So you know, gardens inside the building, you know, this kind of biophilia or the ability for people to kind of connect to nature, particularly in an urban context, that's critical. And the lower left, you see, in fact, that's a really um, very very typical. Uh, like ACT, like drop-in ceiling, but we specified the tiles with a reflective um, surface so that the ceiling uh, reflects the daylight as it comes in through the upper part of the facade and brightens that room tremendously. And then you see how the clear stories at, above, you know, at the walls between the, the various rooms, you know, allow all that daylight to really penetrate deep into the, into the building exactly like right, right there. Um, and then, you know, other other things like in the lower uh, right, uh, you know, using, you know, curtains to generate either privacy or glare control on the outside, introduce color, uh, but give people a, a flexible way to deal with problems, um, you know, rather than sort of like putting films or, or something on the facade that is permanent, but, you know, use that as, use that as an opportunity to introduce a, another softer element uh, that people, again, that people could control. Soto, you want to share the utmost colleague that uh, compliment that colleague, <laughs> colleague compliment, compliment from a colleague that Matt got from our mid-century modern master. Uh, I can't remember what, what did, well, no, I don't remember it. I don't remember it. What was it? No, there was, there was Ron Lindgren um, as our most loyal. Oh, viewer, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. No, so he, was, he, you, he you, was, he was Ron, our, our good friend in Long Beach, California, very long experienced architect. 
uh, was very pleased with everything that, that Matt's been showing us and the interactivity and the livability. Um, he had a lot of praise for it. And that's, I think, a really positive statement from somebody who knows what he's talking about. Yeah, and he's a temperate <laughs> boy, you know, grew up close to where you uh, are working now. And, but he has left us with the finest, easy breezy, bioclimatic, tropical, exotic architecture as his masterpiece, utmost masterpiece of the Hali Kolani. So, you know, he, uh, he brought yeah. this home and saying, especially I think he was complimenting the top left impression here with bringing nature inside, which again, uh, you're deprived of in the tempered, you know, no leaves on the trees, everything <laughs> looks brown, kind of depressing. And just mm -hmm. bringing nature in doesn't just, you know, obviously scientifically, help um, as for really, uh, you know, uh, improving the indoor air quality, but it also psychologically improves, right? There's the people factor again, which I think you put it perfectly that to the sort of initiating, you know, very people friendly based paradigm of Gunter when Stefan and you added, uh, you know, the planet friendliness to that, that shows here how it all comes together in, in a really mm -hmm. good way. And yes, the soda, we've been talking about curtains a lot as a very simple but efficient and effective, uh, you know, um, climate operating device that might be enough for us. So like the shower curtain wall that, you know, the <laughs> almost a desperate attempt, you know, in Dusseldorf <laughs> for the winter on a Lanai, yeah, but, right? But, but that but actually here it does work, work, right? Yeah, and that's no, all we and, need. And and let me also say, uh, Martin, those types of covers really do work for plants in mm -hmm. temperate climates during the winter. And it seems like it. How could that possibly do it? But even just a plastic, little plastic cover makes a huge difference in plants surviving the winter. So mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. really does make a difference. It looks yeah. flimsy, but it works. And it would make a big difference for us, you know, you can just, when a storm comes, we just got out of one, you know, you close the thing and the rain, it keeps the rain out. And when the sun is back, which is today, you just open the thing up and it's very, very minimal material, right? It's, um, of course, you know, it'd be good. There's a biodegradable version of that, that NASA has been developing biodegradable plastics and stuff, but you know, that's the whole circular economy and ecology buzzwordy thing that's rightly so going on but you know that's just uh, for more discussion more refined discussions we're at the end of the show but next week we will be back and we will get to uh the other building that we selected from your recent body of work Matt, that we think might be even more to learn from for our climate and culture here and uh <laughs> we don't tell you more at this point so you will be back next week so see you then and until then please stay equally enthusiastically bioclimatically eruptive as and out of the way of lava too <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs>